All right. Thank you very much. It's uh, really good to be here. Thank you, Mind, Music, and Movement. Uh, Beth, thanks for having me. Uh, Lilia, thanks for doing this with me. She's going to help me out here in a minute. We're going to talk for, uh, I'll be talking for maybe 15 to 18 minutes, and then with a, probably about a 10 minute demo at the very most at the end with some movements. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and get started. I'd also like to give a shout out to my dear friend, Russ Parker. Russ is here um, as an attendee. He's also one of our instructors on my, uh, I'm trying to get this, uh, I'm a little technically challenged. Here we go. From the beginning, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, yeah. So Russ is uh, one of our instructors and he also is a person living with PD and he's amazing. So good. Good to have you here, Russ. All right, so the name of the brand that I started, I think it was six years ago now officially, is um, Parkinson's Regeneration Training. The intention behind the name really has to do with regenerating a better, let's say, or improved quality of life. Okay, and of course, Lilia is going to join me in a little bit. Um, I have a lot to go through, so I'm going to move right along. All right. What I want to mention, first of all, is the methodology that I have used or that I do use, um, this is intended to complement medical care and medications and not to replace them. I also want to give a shout out to our uh, Dr. Dalvi. That was a really great presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Great material. I just want, want to make sure we uh, people know that we're not here to try to replace anything. We work together and you'll see uh, when we get through this, working together is going to help to improve quality of life for a person living with Parkinson's. Of course, there's an overflow there too, right? Because you're gonna have caregivers, family members, maybe coworkers, friends, especially caregivers. A lot of times they get left out in the mix and not thought of as much, but if they get a break too, to some degree, well, that's really nice. Okay, so much of our education is based on research, but not all of it. And here's why. I like research, I like it a lot. I use it as much as possible, but sometimes I can't find research to, let's say, prove what I feel is probably effective. And so we have to become to some degree with a sensible approach based on our experience and our knowledge and keeping the client safe down at the bottom of the slide here, keep them safe, but challenge them. We have to go outside, we have to experiment with things. So that's what we do. All right, moving right along here, the intention of the program in general, and uh, it's kind of interesting. I've traveled to, I think it's almost 30 countries. I, I don't know, I'm not saying that to impress you, but the bottom line is that I notice a large difference in the amount of education that is existing, even between regions of different countries. Uh, the, the, you know, what, what they know, what's there, what they have access to, can vary. Sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes it's almost nothing. As a matter of fact, in Uganda, where I have not been yet, but they believe, many people still believe that if you get near somebody with Parkinson's, you'll catch it. We know it's not contagious. So it's part of our education. And there's a gentleman there, Hanneken Kabugo, doing amazing things to help um, people to realize it's not contagious. And it's not witchcraft. If you get into an arg argument with your mother-in-law, this is the thing in Uganda, they feel you could get Parkinson's from that. So the idea is, um, and not to diminish them or anybody, is to provide um, uh, filling the gap, bridging the gap, filling the void between what's in the left here with medical care, neurology, physical therapy, education, and to what degree it exists wherever we are. And then on the right is to improve the functional life for a person living with PD and of course caregivers and everybody right who are around them. So the double arrow in the middle represents um, and it's always growing, always growing more and more and more that we can provide to help people. Moving forward. Okay. I learned at the uh, WPC conference in 2016 in Portland, Oregon, it was stated and I thought it was so appropriate to use this Parkinson's disease as a full body multifunction experience. I think anyone living with Parkinson's would probably agree with that. Our goal, let's help 
to live a full and active life. Let's help to slow disease progression. Let's help to reduce fall risk. Let's help to positively impact cognition. And I forgot to put memory in there. Memory, movement, quality of life for the person with PD and caregivers. And for anyone who is uh, genetically predisposed or otherwise uh, has the potential of developing Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, well, we want to uh, demonstrate things that can help to delay disease onset. Now that's all based in research. All right, our most immediate concern for a person with Parkinson's is falling. Does anybody here have Parkinson's? Do you know anybody with it? You don't have to answer because I can't see you, but do you know anyone who's fallen? Have you ever fallen? Have you ever gotten injured? So people with Parkinson's are at a much higher risk of falls and injury. As a matter of fact, statistically, last that I know of and checked, the number one cause of mortality in the, per, uh, the Parkinson's population are complications from a fall. So not necessarily the fall itself. All right, I know a particular case, and this has happened many times all over, but I know one particular case in Toronto where a neurologist friend of mine, Dr. Alfonso Fasano, is an amazing neurologist, said one of his patients fell down, knocked their head on a rock, um, had to go to the hospital. The person had Parkinson's. A month later, the person died of pneumonia. So it wasn't the fall, but statistically, breathing issues are number two cause of mortality. So falling is a, a something we want to work on uh, reducing the risk of. Now, we also know that, um, adjust my thing here, okay. We know that movement lights up the brain. This comes, these are words direct from an interview with a gentleman, uh, Dr. John Rady. You may have heard of him. He's a uh, Harvard Medical School professor. I interviewed him last year in my interview series, and I have all of his books, including a new one that just came out, ADHD 2.0. Amazing, because a lot of the stuff in there applies to people, well, all humans and people with Parkinson's too, as far as managing movement and thought processes. But bottom line is, John says, and it's true, movement lights up the brain. Let's move forward. As a matter of fact, the ultimate, what, what we want to do is we want to create as much brain activity as possible. All right, so how can we do this? Well, again, this comes from Harvard and many other places too, but direct, and this one is from John Radia Harvard. Move, that's the first thing. Get moving. You get blood and oxygen to the brain. Even if you're moving around, just walking at a casual pace, you're moving. Blood, oxygen flowing. Well, if you're working out, if you're exercising, even if it's a brisk walk to the, the uh, let's say, the highest speed you can go safely without falling, well, that's going to be good. Walking is one of the best things we can do. But we can add to this. We can gamify. And I'm big on gamifying with all the people that I work with. In fact, I even do it in my own workouts. Play is my, uh, my thing on the slide here, but do something fun. We'll go through examples in a minute. Do it outdoors. Outdoors gives a lot of stimuli, especially, um, especially visual. Now audio too, you may have sounds of nature or maybe a sounds of traffic, but whatever it is, uh, the, 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 being outside is actually really good for your immune system too, especially if you can do this in a place where you're near green, maybe you're on grass or you're near woods or you're in the woods. It's perfect. Music can help. And of course, nobody would know it better than um, the people hosting this here because of the mind music and movement. Music can change brain activity. It can change neural firing pathways. It can help people to move better, walk better. And another thing, if you can move barefoot, now you want to do it in a safe place, right? You don't want to be walking outside with glass and all that kind of stuff. But if you have a place you can move around barefoot and especially outside, well, you're going to help to wake up the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, because the plantar skin, and we'll show you a wake up technique too. Uh, that Lily is going to go through with us in a little while through a vibration technique that helps to wake up central and peripheral nervous systems, get more proprioceptive input to the brain so that 
the brain has more information coming in and it can send out a stronger signal to help you move, walk, balance, and all, all that doing it better. All right, let's talk about circuitry. Your brain is comprised of countless amounts of circuit uh, circuits. If you look at the image down on the right, you'll see these little bright flashes. Those are meant to represent neural, I'm sorry, synaptic electrical firing, uh, like little firing, you know, they just boom, they explode when you're doing something that activates the neurons. And in between the neurons are these little electrical patterns. We'll get to more about that in a minute. We know that in Parkinson's, the substantia nigra housed inside the basal ganglia, midbrain, it is a, a high dopamine production center in the brain. Now, dopamine, is, dopamine is produced in many parts of the body, but when it comes to substantia nigra, in Parkinson's, and you probably already know this, but let's remind ourselves that these um, brain cells in that particular part of the brain, they're starting to die. And if we have less brain cells producing dopamine, eventually, you know, you can get up to, depends upon who the research come from, like 50% of the cells are not functioning anymore and you're still asymptomatic. Well, it depends. I've heard 40%, 60%, 30%. Bottom line is at some point, it's going to affect movement and probably cognition because it's not the only part of the brain that is affected. There are other areas too, but it starts in the substantia nigra. So this will affect some of the existing circuits. We'll talk about circuits in a minute. When one neural circuit is compromised, the brain has what we call neuroplasticity. Other circuits will be developed. Now, neuroplasticity is something, it's just so amazing. You know, the brain will adapt itself to experience whatever you do. The brain has the ability to reorganize and create new neural pathways to adapt as it needs to. So we want to take advantage of this. We want to work on retraining the brain to develop new synaptic firing patterns and new neural circuitry and pathways to help to improve movement and reduce falls. We can also help with cognition and memory. We know the substantia nigra is still functioning to some degree, but it now has to outsource to the cerebellum, probably mostly the cerebellum was what most neurologists who I know uh, would say, but also maybe the frontal area. And there might be other areas. It doesn't even matter. What matters is we know we can take advantage of neuroplasticity to help other areas develop as movement control centers. Examples for, and by the way, everything I talk about, this applies to all people. This is not just Parkinson's. My mother fell down and broke her ankle three years ago because she wouldn't do anything that I recommended for balance. She has no diagnosis of anything, but guess what? She does now. She's moving really well. 85 years old. She's doing all right. 86 this year, I think. Anyways, when we learn how to do something, ride a bike, drive a car, I'm still trying to learn Spanish, learn a new skill, things like that, we're doing it consciously and deliberately. All right, so what we're going to do is in our training sessions, and at the end with Ilya, we'll go through some real simple examples of challenging a person to implement cognitive training during focused movement. So this would be like multitask or dual task training. Because dual tasking is something or multitask, a lot of times that'll literally trip somebody up. They might freeze um, center of gravity, chest and all that passes over the frozen foot and they fall down and we don't want this. So we wanna work on these things to improve them because whatever we do in a session or in all the sessions, we want this stuff to transfer out the door with them and help them in the activities of daily living. So this for frequent and repetitive training to develop a new devel uh, ability or skill, this causes, as you'll see on the right, more synapses happening between neurons. Those bright little lights are little electrical things. It causes the formation of new synaptic firing patterns between neurons. And through regular training, these neural firing patterns are reinforced. And the more solid the connections between the neurons, the better we perform the skills, just like riding a bike. Remember, were you good at it the first time? Probably not. But eventually you got good at it. 
and you didn't have to think about it anymore. You just get on and go, right? So let's talk real quick about neuroplasticity. We want to do it. We want to learn how to maximize it. And this, folks, if there's anything I want you to listen and pay attention to, this is it, okay? There is a very distinct difference in uh, how age will play a role. So distinct difference in, let's say, I'm on track time-wise, just making sure. Children and young adult brains are highly neuroplastic. So I, I was in Mexico uh, a couple of years. I remember it was my first trip in 2018. I think I've been there eight times, but not that it matters, but I got to travel around a lot. And what's really interesting is the first trip blew me away because these two ladies, uh, they're physical therapists, they came up to me at breakfast. They said, oh, we really enjoyed your presentation the night before, you know, the night before. Or last night, they're speaking English. There, there's no accent. And I said, well, where are you from? Oh, you know, Mexico City and Monterey or wherever. And I just, I had to ask, I said, well, your English is perfect. Oh, yeah, well, we learned it when we were, you know, little kids, like we could speak fluently by the age of four or five or whatever, you know. Well, that's what happens. And if you look at the research, you'll see that exposure alone can prompt the creation of, there's the typo. There it is, PF is supposed to be OF, the creation of new neural circuitry. Oh, sometimes I get self-deprecating. It's kind of, you know, just fun. If I wasn't ridiculous, I'd be boring. So anyways, the brain customizes itself based on experiences. Okay, well, adult brains are different, okay? over the age of 25 or, you know, approximately. So I'm painting with a broad brush, by the way, on many things, but generally speaking, over the age of 25, and then the older we get, the more this is true. We have to pay attention to what it is that we want to learn. Now, I, I still, after four years in high school of Spanish, two semesters in college, 102 and 103, because I tested in at 102. So I was, you know, I knew some. In the eight trips to Mexico, I'm still not fluent. And it's really hard, but I'm getting better. But if I was four years old learning, well, it'd be a whole different deal, right? Well, I have to direct my attention. There is a phrase that was coined by Dr. Andrew Huberman at Stanford University. It's called self-directed adaptive plasticity. This is what we as adults are having to do. What's really cool about the brain, it's an organ, right? But it's the it's not the only organ in the body that can change. All the organs can change and they do over time, but the brain can decide to change. You're human, you have the power of free will in a human way, and you know you have it. And so now you can actually choose to learn something. And this means you can direct your attention. If I was to say right now, for example, I guarantee you're not thinking about this right now, but you will be when I ask. How do your feet feel touching the floor? Are your shoes comfortable? Well, now you're thinking about it, right? So we can direct our attention. We can direct the changes in our brain by implementing two primary steps. Let's go through these. This is actually the longest part of the thing, but we're we're moving right along and we're on track here. So Step one is going to be extreme focus, hyper focus. When I work with a person, I have people, sometimes they can focus on uh, uh, just whatever for two minutes, three minutes, maybe it's 30 seconds. It doesn't matter what it is. What does matter is they do it for as long as they can. And then the fatigue sets in. And then they take a break. We do something else, you know, maybe you don't have to think as much or at all, but they're still moving, maybe. Short bouts of extreme focus and deliberate effort. Take note of the word deliberate, intentional effort, which will vary uh, from person to person and even the same person from day to day. You know how it is. I mean, some days people do better than others, including myself. Okay, so we extreme focus, deliberate effort. And then when we do this, there's a thing called noradrenaline. It's released during these periods of focus. This is the, the chemical 
that's going to cause that feeling of strain or maybe discomfort doing movement. I mean, that's a separate thing from pain. Pain's a whole different deal, right? So during this focused effort, if you feel strain or discomfort, you're probably, you know, experiencing the release of noradrenaline and that's normal. And we, what we want to do is what this says at the bottom is if we can get through these short bouts, a few of them, like in an hour, let's say, maybe there's 10 bouts of extreme focus. And we're thinking each time I'm attaching a reward to the effort. This is me getting better. This is me getting better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to move better. I'm going to not fall anymore. Or maybe I'll never fall because I haven't fallen yet. We're going to keep it that way. Well, discomfort can occur, but attaching a reward can be highly beneficial to help complete the learning event or the training event. During this focused ever effort, there's another chemical release called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, people say it different. I say it the way Stanford says it, is released at the synapses involved of what is being learned. So there's a certain group of neurons, or I should say probably several groups, if you're, you know, jumping through an agility ladder or walking and throwing a ball from one hand to another and whatever neurons uh, are firing together the, and the the uh, neurons that are firing they're uh, having this acetylcholine being released at the synapses this marks the neurons for strengthening by the way a neuron is a brain uh, it's a cell okay so just in case anyone wonders. All right, so step two, it's really easy. Well, for me, it is. If anyone paid me to sleep, I'd be really rich because I'm really good at sleeping. Step two is sleep or a sleep-like state. Sleep is the best, especially when you get into stage, what is it called? Three or four, the deep sleep. You know, if you can get a couple hours of deep sleep in, like usually it happens you know, before the REM, I think. I'm not an expert in that area, but sleep, sleep-like state, reduction of brain activity. So you're not thinking maybe you're, I do naps all the time. Um, every day, 20 minute nap, every day. I never miss. Meditation. I have trouble with that. But I mean, if, if you do that, that's another place where you can reduce brain activity. So this is the time when the neural pathways are strengthened those pathways that were marked by acetylcholine. And the circuitry is best formed and strengthened during sleep. Now, we want to train both motor and cognitive at the same time, all in an effort to improve movement stability, functionality, and to help to reduce the uh, chances of falling, right? So there are many benefits to cognitive training during movement. Let's talk about types of it. We're almost there, folks. So uh, to the demo, that is. These come actually from uh, Stony Brook University, right down near Russ Parker, in Long Island. Now, there are many more types of cognitive training, but we're just going to go through four, well, three primary, and then a fourth one that's a combination of two of these. So that, um, that what is um, interesting about these is when we look at direct recall, spatial awareness, and decision-making as three primary domains of cognition, the reason it's important to notate that uh, these are domains is because when you perform these types of cognitive training, each one fires synaptic uh, patterns in the brain differently than each other one. And we wanna develop as many as we can neural pathway wise. We, we want as many as possible. So that transfers out the door and we move better and live a better life. Direct recall is at the top of the page. Maybe it's, uh, 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 there's a whole bunch of examples we can go through. It could be naming a city, spelling it forward, spelling it, the name of the capital of the state. Oh, you know, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, spell it forward, spell it backwards. Count, name every model of car that you've ever owned. Uh, name, uh, uh, during the election years, we have fun with presidents. You know, name a president, uh, current one, and go all the way back to as far as you can remember. Name the vice presidents, things like that. Name kitchen appliances, body parts. That's direct recall. And the sky's the limit. There's so many things we could. I have a guy who likes to uh, name Broadway shows while he's doing like two other things at the same time. And then he'll tell me the characters in the shows. 
my client, Jerry, he's a great guy. So anyways, spatial awareness, you can have people doing whatever they're doing, moving hand eye coordination at the same time. Again, we do what they can, not what they can't tell them. Uh, how do you get from here to your neurologist office? Take me getting in. Let's get in your car. Take me down the road. Tell me every street, every, you know, how many stop lights, how many stop signs, if they can remember, do your best, be as detailed as possible. Spatial decision making. This is fun. Uh, I, I have mitts. I don't have them with me, but you know, I got a mitt here, I got a right mitt, got a left mitt. I put boxing gloves on them. This is one of like 25 different things we do. Um, I got yellow tape on this one, green tape here, or I'll use blue and green on this. So let's say blue and green. I say punch right, boom, they hit right, right, boom, left, boom, blue, boom, yellow, boom. Step it up a notch now. Whatever I say, do the opposite, left. So they do the right right and so on and so forth so it can be fun too now the last one um that i have listed and remember there are several other other types of uh, domain domains and memory too you can test for memory train for memory is problem solving actually this uh is most fun for me when i'm in london teaching at the parkour gym owned by dan edwards parkour regenerations and basic i'm sorry parkour generation regeneration is in my head for my program. This involves basically obstacles. And we did this. We, in fact, we were doing a hashtag for a while, parkour for Parkinson's. It was really cool. It was really fun because what people would do, and a lot of times you ever notice somebody with Parkinson's might have a problem or they're challenged going over a threshold, going over uh, through a doorway, things like that. These obstacles are all set up almost all of them are set up where you can go either over it, maybe under it, around it, or through it. And when you're doing this, you're actually using a combination of spatial and decision making at the same time. Really cool stuff. I won't go through these slides. I'll just say other examples for direct recall are here. If anyone wants this slideshow, they're welcome to it. I'll fix that typo that's in there. Spatial awareness, ideas, decision making. So before we get to BDNF and then to uh, bring in Lilia in, goal, deliberate and focused actions during training lead to subconscious movement patterns. When you learn, let's just use one example, the bicycle. I remember my kids, I remember myself actually. I never had training wheels, I'm bragging, right? No, I, I worked and worked and worked at it and I was terrible. Well, my kids were too, but within a couple of days, they just go. You had to focus it first, and then it became part of like an, a pattern that's more in the subconscious and you just get on, you go. That's what we want to happen to the best of our abilities. Not saying we always get there, but if we can get towards that and improve movement and, and especially reduce fall risk, that's a winner. All right, time is good. Okay, so we're almost there. Lilia, we're two minutes away at the most. Best known method of slowing disease progression via exercise is cardio. Why? Well, we get blood and oxygen to the brain. This is uh, research based too, so I didn't make it up. Creating brain derived neurotrophic factor is paramount. You'll, well, just look at the right side of the slide. When you're moving, your brain, when you're, I should say, when you're moving and your heart rate is elevated, uh, according to Stony Brook, for the equivalent of walking as fast as you can for 20 minutes minimum. But there are other variables in there too. Broad brush, remember, broad brush here. An enriched environment, mental stimulation, social interaction, physical exercise, this active state increases neuronal activity, helps to uh, this creation of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a protein and a hormone. It circulates in the brain as a result of the elevated heart rate, and it helps to, when it attaches to the receptors into the brain cells, it helps to maintain cellular structure and integrity. And it also helps with the uptake of medications and keeping them in the system longer. I won't read all the words. Oh, and maybe help delay disease onset. Okay, so let's just one thing here. If, if anyone's on cinnamon, levodopa, carbidopa, or any other uh, dopamine replacements, especially cardio is the thing that's most likely to get this um, up 
have it uptake into your system faster. So you go from an off period to on more quickly and you move better for longer because it stays in your system for longer. That is it for me as far as slides. Now I have a little thing here I want to do. Want to, uh, first of all, bring in the director of mind movement music. This is my friend, an amazing trainer, amazing person, Lilia Drew. How are you, Lilia? I'm great. I'm very happy to be here. I'm so glad you're with me. Um, now, it looks like we have a final grand prize raffle. Ah, that's at the end, isn't it? We'll do that right after this. Let's go into this, this stuff we're going to demo. It'll only take probably five minutes max. The first thing we're going to do, which was not in the slideshow, is vibration. Lilia has a uh, hyper ice, and this is actually one of the prizes. Yeah. It's one of the prizes. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, Tyler DiCamillo over at uh, Hyper Ice was nice enough to donate this so that it can be given away to somebody as a prize. Where vibration therapy can be used, and this is a lot of the research shows uh, this too, especially. Uh, for tremor reduction, a temporary tremor reduction. So if you turn on the vibrating ball, and if Lilia holds it in both hands with as much finger skin and palmer skin uh, contacting the ball while it's vibrating, I've seen people change from, you know, a, a tremor that's fairly significant to, you know, it could take 20 minutes or in a lot of times it's five or 10 minutes and they're down to no tremor or very, very diminished tremor. An advantage here can be something like um, maybe they hold it while they're going to dinner and whoever it is is with them drives them to dinner and they hold it. And when they get to dinner, they're not so worried about spilling something. Okay, so it or, you know, maybe it helps them to text or type or write better. Another area we can use it is on the feet. So we would do this with uh, bare feet. The reason we do it with bare feet is because we want to wake up those sensory and mechanical receptors that tend to go to sleep. They're not dead, but they go to sleep after decades of wearing shoes and socks. Oh yeah, we're on track. We're good with time. Okay. So um, we slowly move it around. You know, the, the ball is amazing for helping to wake up the sensory and mechanical receptors. And again, this can make a big difference. Well, it may not make a big difference. It might make a small difference. Any uh, difference towards improving movement is something we want. So in some cases, this can make a difference uh, to a large extent in people getting more proprioceptive in input from foot to brain because the plantar skin on the bottom of the foot is the most highly densely populated with small, small nerve endings of all the skin on our body. So we really want to wake this up. Now, if you don't have a ball, walk around barefoot. Walk around barefoot for a while. Do it outside if you can. We got a foot of snow here last night, so no barefoot outside for me today. Um, you should come up here. There's a foot of snow. Anyways, um, next on our list... So vibration, remember, vibration can be used for a lot of things. Uh, dys, uh, dystonia, constipation, restless leg syndrome, any kind of involuntary movements. All right, let's go into um, what's next on our list here. The towel. Yeah, we're going to create some cardio. Quick burst of cardio to create that BBNF. So I want to show you, I do this at all the workshops because I want to make sure you realize that there's no excuse. I, I just kind of busted on people, right? But no excuse for not doing cardio. You might not want to do it, but when you start doing something, you activate these dopamine. Uh, dop dopamine gets fired up. And when you have more active dopamine, you actually probably feel like doing the thing you just started. You just have to get started. So 30 seconds, Lilia, can you show us the towel flaps you're going to do? And I've got a timer here. 30 seconds. Or even just moving your arms back and forth, a t-shirt, anything. Please join us. It's 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a towel, grab a towel. If not, pretend you have a towel. 30 seconds. Show us what to do and go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. There's a lot of ways to do this. Yeah, you can play around with it. Have fun. The point is to move as quickly as possible. 
and you can do it standing or sitting, whatever you want. You know, for, for a lot of people, sitting is easier. How many seconds are we at? You could also grab it by the corners like, like this, just flap yeah. like that. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do this. Two, one, done. Let's do arm sprints. You don't even need a towel for this one. You can just, all you're doing with your arms is moving them, sitting or standing, ready, set, and, and again, go. If you want to join us. Ready, set, and go. Arm sprints. And you can do this to your ability. So if you have any shoulder problems, you can just do this with your elbows, or you can yeah. do whatever you can. The point is to move for 30 seconds. 10 more seconds. So, you know, nobody's going to want to do this for a half an hour or 20 minutes, but you could do 30 on a minute off 30 on 30 seconds off, whatever it is, two, one, boom, you're done. So there is um, two things that we can do right there for cardio. And now you just learned uh, about vibration and cardio. Let's use the towel and just so one strength thing. All right. Let's do that squat to row. So Lily is going to take the towel. She's going to like try to pull it apart the whole time that she's going in and out and squatting to row. It's a multi-joint movement. It's awesome. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go for it. Okay. So basically you're going to sit down, up, and you're going to pull. Squat down, up, pull. And you know, if anybody feels a little bit shaky for this, you can always use a chair and sit down. Stand up, pull. Sit down, stand up, pull. So you're creating strength through your shoulders and your lower body. And Absolutely. It's, total, it's a multi-jointed movement. So you're moving all the joints in your body. And we all sit down and we all pull things, right? Perfect. Do we have 30 seconds for one more thing? Start it. Let's do 30 seconds, one more thing. You're gonna take that towel, put it on the floor maybe, or something and step over it. And we're almost done, we're 30 seconds out at the most here. Just wanna show you a cognitive training thing during focused movements. So we're gonna have Lilia just move either front to back or side to side over the towel. And whilst you do this, so you start stepping, we're gonna have her, what's the capital of Texas? Oh dear God, um, Austin. How do you spell it? A-U-S-T-I-N. How do you spell it backwards? N-I-T-S-U-A. Yes. Okay, we could do more, but I'm out of time, and I don't want to get anyone behind schedule. Thank you, Lilia. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm grateful. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day of moving, singing, and learning. Woo! You were awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very, um, very, very much. We will let our audience know about your wonderful book, Carl. And oh, um, we did have a question um, from the audience about uh, the possibility of doing virtual training with either you or Lilia. Are you available for that? Um, I, I am not at this point. I'm completely swamped I'm so, uh, but yeah no I, I don't want to take anything away from anybody try Lilia if she doesn't have time I know people okay so they <laughs> if you are interested we have our wonderful Lilia Drew uh, two days a week virtually free um, from you can register from our website we offer um, not only Lilia's movement and balance but we also offer uh, rock steady boxing along mm. with our chorus and many other things um, as Carl had mentioned in my um, uh, about riding a bicycle well that's kind of how I feel about this whole zoom experience um, <laughs> I'm learning how to ride a bicycle using zoom <laughs> so I get a little nervous I'm a little camera shy and I just wanted to thank everyone again and um, 
Make note that Dr. Dalvi is a movement disorder specialist and he is here and local to us in Florida. He is on our medical advisory committee and he has been my go-to doc um, when I have questions along with Dr. Fruck, who you heard from early this morning, who is our uh, medical director and on the medical advisory committee with Dr. Dalvi is Dr. Saringer, Rebecca Gould, who is an amazing speech uh, therapist here local to us in Florida, and Emily Large, who uh, I hope will be getting more and more involved with me here with the foundation. She's a wonderful physical therapist at a Flagler Institute. And our advisory committee, you just saw one of them, Miss Lilia Drew. She is my powerhouse, who I uh, just adore. And Cece Lester, Laureen Hunter, Helene Katz, and Carl Sterling, woohoo! And Melissa Moranti, she is special to somebody else here who's today, but she is an absolute doll, and Gina Kelly, who have helped me through this uh, work bringing this to you today and I love working with them and hope I can convince them to do more with me and Patty Raber Max has become a big part of our foundation you heard from her earlier and you will be hearing from Colleen Sturgis in the background you I told you about Nancy and Billy who are just beyond amazing and we've had other people so involved with us Steve and Debbie Sandler uh, just a huge shout out to everybody if I didn't mention your name please forgive me I'm a little nervous I'm riding that bicycle and I get nervous um, so that's just I love you all and I know you're in this journey with me uh, to make an amazing foundation. But there are two people who I want to make note of. May, could you just turn on your camera for a second? I hope she will. Where are you, May? Oh, uh, there she is. <laughs> so, May, I don't even know what to say. Um, I wanted to catch everybody to catch you. Um, she is my right arm. And she and I have been working endless hours, morning, noon, and night. And without her, I don't know where we'd be. Um, I love her. I love her as a person. I love her heart. I love her energy. I love her work ethic is right there with me. We get so much done. And I just want to, the world to know how much you are appreciated and loved from all of us. And a newer person, if he wouldn't mind turning his camera on for one second, he's coordinating this for us today, is Federico Giller. And he is running our production. And he, you will be seeing a video that he produced for Colleen Sturgis at lunch. Um, and you, can we see you? Yep. You can awesome. See yeah. There he is. So thank you. Everybody, um, I, I can't thank you enough. And now Scott is going to tell us about one of our other sponsors. After Scott is done, we're going to take a five-minute potty break. <laughs> 